he amazing tonight? Wonderful and holy beyond compare. There's nobody like him. There's no one like the Lord. Amen. Who is like the Lord? There's no one like him. Aren't you glad to be here in church tonight in the presence of God where we can worship him, pray, fellowship with one another? Amen. Well, welcome to Wednesday night Bible study. We're going to study the Bible tonight. We've been doing that for the past few weeks. Keep going. And we're going to continue on with our study of the book of Revelation. Right where we left off. All right, so if you have your Bibles with you, or a Bible on an electronic device, or if you don't have either, it'll be up on the screen behind me. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. Book of Revelation 1, 1, the first part of the verse. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which must shortly take place. And we're going to be continuing on, as I said a moment ago, on our lessons about the revelation of of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be here. Worship you and feel your presence, Lord, and be in your presence one more time. I pray, Lord Jesus, your will be done in this place that you might be glorified, Lord. Help me to say, Lord, what you want me to say. Touch our hearts and our ears tonight, God. Help us to understand your word and have a love for your word. Your will be done, Lord, that you might be glorified, Lord, for the furtherance of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And please be seated. All right, so We've already covered chapters 1, 2, and 3. One was kind of an introduction to the book, and then John saw this vision of, of Jesus, and then he said, you know, write these letters to the seven churches of Asia, and chapters 2 and 3 were the letters to the seven churches. And then for the fourth lesson, I kind of did a, if you were here last week, we did kind of an overview of some of the themes and some terminology. I wanted to kind of get that out of the way. So now we're going to pick up again, and I'm going to try to cover chapters 4 and 5 tonight. They're both shorter chapters, and they're basically like one one literary unit, and I'm pretty confident that we'll be able to get them done tonight. But if not, if it gets around, you know, 10 after 8, and I've, if I've got like one slide left, I'll just finish it. But if there's a bunch left, we'll just kind of tack it onto the beginning of the next lesson. But I'm pretty sure we'll be able to do 4 and 5 tonight. So, all right, so fasten your seatbelts, put your thinking caps on, and ready to go. All right, so <laughs> Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Now, remember, this is after the letters to the seven churches. So John says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. All right. So after, he starts out with, After these things I looked. After these things. Metatauta. Now the verse opens and closes with these same words. Okay, that's significant. So, in the opening of the verse, where he says, after these things I looked, what does he mean by after these things? Well, he just means after Jesus got done speaking about the seven churches. So he got done with these letters, okay, to the church in Ephesus, write this. The church in Smyrna, write this. Uh, so he means, okay, after he did that, I looked, saw that, after these things. Um, now, where before he saw Jesus standing before him, with the lamp stands around him and the seven stars in his hand. Now he looks and he sees a door in heaven open, or a door in the sky, basically. He's seeing a vision, so he's looking up and seeing a door. Uh, the word for heaven and sky in Greek is the same word. So in English it's very different, but it could be, it's interchangeable in Greek. So it basically means he looked up into the air, saw like a door in heaven open. And he says he heard a voice like a trumpet. Now most likely this is the voice of Christ speaking to him again. As in chapter 1, it said he had a voice like a trumpet speaking to him. Probably the same thing. It doesn't say, you know, later in the book, there's places where an angel speaking to him, and it'll say an angel. So we can just assume this is probably Christ speaking to him again. And he's, he's talking to him. About, he says, I have to show you things which must take place. So what John was about to see was going to be in the future, things that hadn't happened yet. And he says, things which must take place after this, there's that phrase again, metatauta. Literally, it means after these things. It's plural. So after these things. So what is Jesus, or the speaker, whoever it is, probably Jesus, what does he mean by that? So John said, after these things I looked. So after we got done with these letters to the churches, okay, I looked up and I saw this doorway. Now Jesus is saying, things which must take place after these things. So he's meaning slide here. So what is that? It means after the churches? 
after the letters are written? Well, it's probably after the church age. That makes the most sense. So when the time of the church is done, after these things, and we're talking about the church, now he's saying after these things, things are going to take place. So when the time of the church is completed, what happens? We learned about this last week. The church is going to be caught up, the rapture, to be with the Lord. So he's showing John things that must take place, things that have to take place after these things, after the church. That's how I would interpret it. Okay, so he says, immediately I was in the spirit. Okay, so he's not literally going up to heaven. He's seeing a vision. He's in the spirit. And behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Not three. One sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Hmm, that's interesting. So in the spirit, so as in chapter 1, he's seeing a spiritual vision, okay? So when we go to heaven, this isn't necessarily what we're going to see. You know, we're going to see Jesus on the throne. But this is just a vision he's seeing to show certain things to him. So he says, like a, the one sat on the throne like a jasper and a sardius stone. Now what is that? Yaspidi kaisardio. A jasper is a quartz-like stone, often kind of a reddish or yellowish in color. Sardius, or carnelian is a kind of a reddish orange stone. Now I have some pictures here. That's raw jasper, just brought out of the earth. Okay, so it's kind of that red orange rust color. Those are things made of jasper. The one, the little red one there is like a little amulet made of red jasper, and there's a kind of ornamental vase, kind of orangish red color, kind of cool looking. That's jasper. And those are sardius stones, also called sard or carnelian, kind of a reddish color. That's like a ring like the head of the uh, end of a ring of a uh, sardius, kind of an orange color. And that's a red jelly rancher in there. No, it, just, it does kind of look like it. No, that, that's a sardius stone as well, in like an ornamental thing there. Um, but that's what it looks like. So it's kind of like a red, reddish orange color. That's what this guy was like, you know, when, he, when he's in this particular vision, kind of a red orange color. And he said a rainbow like an emerald. Well, we know what emerald looks like. It's green. So this kind of green rainbow around him. Kind of interesting. All right, and around the throne, around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. Hmm. Now, who are these guys? Or whoever. Who are these elders? 24 elders. We've heard that. The four and 20 elders sitting around the throne. 24 elders. Like Hosi Tesseros Presbuteros. Now, we've learned that word before. I don't, you might not remember, but a while back, I did a lesson about, um, like, the ministry and things like that. And it's the same word used for the church leaders in Paul's letters to Timothy and Titus. When he says elders, that's the word there. It's where we get the word presbyter from, presbyteros. Um, could mean, like, a church leader or, you know, literally an older person. But that's this same word here. So that's where these guys are, elders. Now it says, clothed in white robes. Clothed in white robes. Now that, what is that, Perry? I need new glasses. I can read the English really well. Perry Beblemenos, okay. <laughs> Not my first language. Uh, it means having been clothed in white robes. So it's not like, oh yeah, they were just wearing white robes. It says, having been clothed in white robes. Like they had the robes put on them. Like they were given the robes. Okay, that's kind of interesting. It's a little bit different nuance there if you read the Greek. And they had crowns of gold on their heads. Stephanus crucis. Now that's, again, that's Stephanus, that, that victor's crown we've talked about in previous lessons. I think I have a picture. Yeah, the laurel wreath there. Gold, a gold Stephanos, a gold victor's crown. So they were given white robes, they were on thrones, and they had the gold victor's crowns. That sounds familiar. So these elders were given, okay, that's what I just said. They were given white robes, victors, crowns, and thrones as if they were overcoming. Overcomers, this sounds familiar, yeah. These are rewards given to the church. I have a lot of scriptures talking about that. Revelation 3, we learned about that a couple weeks ago. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. James, blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. 
and everyone who, com Paul writing here in 1 Corinthians, talking about people competing in athletic contests, now everyone who competes for the prize is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, a perishable victor's crown, but we for an imperishable crown. First Peter, and when the chief shepherd, that's Jesus, appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. That's the same crown, the victor's crown, the Stephanos. Revelation 2, be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. Behold, Revelation 3, and behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. Same word, the Stephanos, victor's crown. And Revelation 3, here the thrones. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Now again, I illustrated before, that's just symbolic of a reigning with Christ, because we're not literally going to kind of sit next to him on his throne like a little kid, you know, and he's sitting on the, the father, God the father's lap, you know. That's not what we're going to see, okay? The, we're, when we see the throne, we're going to see Jesus on the throne. But this is symbolically representing we're ruling with him. So the thrones, the robes, the crowns, no other individuals are described this way as receiving white garments, victors, crowns, and thrones. They're called elders, which applies to the church. Now, angel, now some people say, oh, these 24 elders, those are angels. That's just angels. Well, angels are never described that way. Now, they're depicted as having white, being dressed in white, but they're not given white garments, and they're not wearing victors' crowns, and they're not sitting in thrones. Angels are not ever described that way in the Bible. So, there's, say there's 24 of them. Okay, well, what does 24 mean? Well, it's 12 times 2. 12 is a special number in Scripture. We see a lot of 12, so that could be part of that. Um, it possibly, this is kind of interesting, it possibly parallels, it. there are 24 divisions of the Old Testament priesthood. We see that in First Chronicles 24. Um, now, later on in the days of the Israelite kingdom, it started out there were just a few priests. There was a high priest and his family. But, of course, over time, there's a lot more. And it ended up where there were literally thousands of priests. So, they're like, well, how do all these people, they're not all going to pack into the temple at once, you know, in Solomon's temple and, and a minister in there. So they had to divide them up into different groups. And, and they would take turns serving. So there were 24 different divisions. And there was one guy over each division. And that kind of, they kind of represented the entire priesthood. So, and, and, by the way, the church is seen as a royal priesthood. It's called that in the New Testament. You, we're, a, we're a royal priesthood. So that's just another thing alluding. This is very possibly the church. Uh, 24 elders symbolically represent the entire church. I really believe that. I don't think there's really anything else that would make sense. Now, some people say, oh, well, maybe it's just kind of Old Testament saints and New Testament, like, well, it's like 12 tribes of Israel or 12 apostles or something like that. Well, you know, the Old Testament righteous people are not raised up yet. They're not going to be resurrected until after the second coming. And they don't get robes and victor's crowns. The church does. Okay? And they're not like, oh, well, they're saints that have already passed away. They're just up there in heaven with the Lord. Well, they're not yet. Because the dead in Christ are going to be raised up at his second coming, and then we're going to be raised up together with them. We're going to go up in the rapture together. So the dead in Christ aren't up there yet. So this is, they've already been up there only the church makes sense here. Only the raptured church makes sense for who these 24 elders are. And this is very significant. Next slide here. So what does this mean? The church is in heaven around the throne before the great tribulation. If this is the church, they're up there before the great tribulation because we're not going to see that start until the next chapter. So this is kind of more indirect evidence of a pre-tribulation rapture. Because really, there's nothing else that really makes sense other than those of the church. That's kind of representative of the church around the throne. That makes the most sense. Then he continues on with his vision. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Now that's kind of further just uh, like a description of the glory and the power of God. Voices, phonai, could also be translated sounds or noises. So it's not necessarily like a voice of someone talking. It could be, but it could also just be sounds, lots of sounds and noises, the same word in Greek. And this here we see these seven spirits of God again. 
this kind of another reference of like a manifestation of God's spirit, God, God's working. Um, there's lots of different descriptions of these. It says, you know, God has them before his throne. Then Jesus said, I have them. So does he kind of share them with God the Father? Well, no, that's, um, yeah, go back to the previous slide. Thanks. Um, so it's just a manifestation of God's spirit. And then we see Jesus says, I have the seven spirits. Here we see before the throne is burning lamps. There's different ways of describing it. So, okay, now we go to the next one. All right, so, and then before the throne, there was a sea of glass, like crystal. Sea of glass. And there's clear quartz crystal. Now, it comes in different colors. It comes in lots of different colors. But the clear crystal, if he says it looks like glass, probably like that. That's kind of cool. So before the throne, this big sea of glass like crystal. Now, here's where it gets interesting. And in the midst of the throne, so kind of right there in the throne, and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. What is this? The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Now, what is that? Four living creatures. Okay, first of all, let's just break down some terms here. Four living creatures. Now, the King James says beasts. Um, a more accurate word is actually, uh, the Greek word is zoon, where we get the word like zoology or zoo from. It just means living one or a living thing. So four living ones, four living things. It's not the same word translated beast. Like later on, we learn about like the beast coming up out of the sea, the Antichrist, the beast. That's a different word. Therion, that's like a wild beast. That's usually like in a more negative context. This isn't the same word. It just means like a living thing. So four living creatures, that's more of an accurate translation there. Okay, so they're full of eyes. That's just weird. What does that mean? It just symbolizes that they're all seeing, you know? So when we go to heaven, it's not like we're going to see these things flying around like covered with eyes, you know? John is being shown a vision to like depict certain things and to demonstrate certain things. So now the, the face is on these things. Lion, calf, man, and eagle. Now, a lot of people say he's very popular. Say, well, this is like the fourfold character of Christ from the Gospels. They say, well, yeah, you know, Matthew, that's kind of the lion because Jesus is the king. And then Mark, he's kind of depicted as a servant. That's the calf, you know, a calf like a cow and an ox, a beast of burden. Luke, kind of emphasize his humanity, that's the man. And then John, more emphasize Christ's divinity, that's the eagle. Now, that, again, that's a very popular explanation. Um, very common to see that. Um, like these are, I don't know what it's supposed to mean. They're showing different attributes of Christ. Obviously, those things aren't Jesus. And it's not like you're saying that those creatures, that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John up there. Like Jesus didn't say, hey, John, you know, see that eagle? That's you. You know, that's not what he's doing. So <laughs> that's not literally what they are. Oh, the lights just went out. That's okay. Um, I can still teach. Is it still up there? Okay. There we go. All right. So the Bible, the Bible doesn't say what these are. It doesn't say they're like the four Gospels depiction of Christ. So that's not really, we don't know that for sure. Okay. So what are these living creatures? What are these things? Now, Ezekiel's vision in the Old Testament, now in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel the prophet, he was standing by a river and God showed him a vision of God's glory. And it'll shed some light on this. It's kind of a long passage. I'm just going to read it so you can see the parallels. I'm not going to get into detail on what everything means. Just listen to it and see how they're similar. So we'll read this. Ezekiel here talking. Then I looked and behold, a whirlwind was coming out of the north, a great cloud with a raging fire engulfing itself, and brightness was all around it and radiating out of its midst like the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. So he's a big fiery cloud here. Also from within it came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man, like there's like a human body. Each one had four faces, each one had four wings. Their legs were straight, so they're standing upright. Soles of their feet were like the soles of calves' feet. They sparkled like the color of burnished bronze. The hands of a man, like they had man's arms under the wings of their four sides each one of the each one had four faces and and each of the four faces and wings okay their wings 
touched one another. The creatures did not turn where they went, but each one went straight forward, so they're kind of moving, looking forward, wherever they're going. As for the likeness of their faces, each had the face of a man. Each of the four had the face of a lion on the right side. Each of the four had the face of an ox on the left side. Baby ox would be a calf. Each of the four had the face of an eagle. Hmm. Thus were their faces. Their wings stretched upward. Two wings of each one touched one another to cover their bodies. And each one went straight forward. They went where, wherever the spirit wanted to go. And they did not turn where they went when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches going back and forth among the living creatures. So it's bright and fiery. The fire was bright. Out of the fire went lightning. So there's lightning, fire, the creatures, the faces, the wings. And the living creatures ran back and forth in appearance like the flash of lightning. Now as I looked at the living creatures, behold, a wheel was on the earth beside each living creature, like a wheel that's riding next to it with its four faces. Appearance of the wheels and their workings was like the color of barrel, kind of a bluish color. And all four had the same likeness. The appearance of their workings was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. When they moved, they went toward any one of the four directions. They did not turn aside where they went, so they went alongside the creatures. As for the rims, they were so high they were awesome, and their rims were full of eyes all around the four of them. There's lots of eyes again. When the living creatures went, the wheels went beside them, and when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up with them. Wherever the spirit wanted to go, they went because where the spirit went and the wheels were lifted together with them. For the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When those went, these went. When those stood, these stood. And when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up together with them. For the spirit of living creatures was in the wheels. The likeness of the firmament, oh, so it's a firmament, like a layer above the heads of the living creatures, was like the color of an awesome crystal stretched out over their heads. And under the firmament, their wings spread out upright, or straight, one toward another. So they're kind of like supporting it. Each one had two wings covered one side. Each one had two which covered one side, and each one had two which covered the other side of the body. When they went, I heard the noise of their wings, like the noise of many waters, so it's loud, lots of noises, like the voice of the Almighty, a tumult, like the noise of an army. And when they stood still, they let down their wings. A voice came from above the firmament that was over their heads. Whenever they stood, they let down their wings, and above the firmament, over their heads, was a likeness of a throne, in appearance like a sapphire stone. Now this one's blue. On the likeness of the throne was a likeness with the appearance of a man high above it. Also from the appearance of his waist, and upward I saw, as it were, like the color of amber, with the appearance of fire all around within it. And from the appearance of his waist, and downward I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire with brightness all around. Like the appearance of a rainbow, there's a rainbow again, in a cloud on a rainy day, so is the appearance of the brightness all around it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Okay, so Ezekiel's vision of the spirit and the glory of God was very similar to what we see in Revelation 4. Some differences, obviously, but we see similarities. These creatures, the wings, eyes, throne, thunder and lightning, the four different faces. Now these four living creatures, they kind of represent God's spirit and glory. Now, they do worship him, but it's just like representative of God's glory, glorifying God, things like that, in the midst of and around the throne, okay? They're not people. Um, are they angels? Nowhere else do, do angels look anything like that, so I kind of doubt it. Maybe there's some sort of spiritual being uh, just represented like this. Again, we're not really going to, when you go to heaven, you're not going to see these things flying around with like a, face on it and full of, cover with eyes. That's just crazy. It's just representing God's glory and his omnipresence and his omniscience. So whenever the living creatures, now we're back in Revelation here, whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him. So they get out of their thrones and fall down before him who sits on the throne and they worship him who lives forever and ever and they cast their crowns before the throne saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Amen. So the church is in heaven worshiping God, casting their crowns before the throne. Now this just demonstrates their recognition of God's sovereignty. So if you have a crown, now these aren't rulers' crowns or victors' crowns they're wearing, but still, and you're bowing down and just throwing your crown down at the feet of a sovereign, you're basically saying, like, you're above me. You're a lot bigger than me. 
you're a lot more powerful recognizing God's sovereignty there. So we're just going to throw those thrones right, uh, crowns right down before the throne. And I saw, now we're on chapter 5 here. See, the narrative just goes right into it. It's just like one unit, so it's, it's kind of a seamless transition here. 5-1, And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. There's a picture I found, a, kind of a digital thing there. A, like a scroll rolled up with seven seals across it, like these wax seals they would put on there. You have to break it to open it. Um, now that was an you know, important document. It would be sealed with something like it's official. And if you put seven on there, that's a lot. So God's on his throne. He has a scroll in his right hand, written on the inside and on the back. So that's an important document with a lot of content in it, written on the inside and the back. Now there's seven seals. So all seven would have to be broken before reading the content. Now, once the seven are broken, we never actually say, it never says, okay, now the seven are broken, now we're going to start reading the scroll, and here's what it says. We just assume that the stuff after the seventh seal is what was in the scroll. It doesn't really say specifically. So he says, Then I saw a strong angel, so that here's an angel, proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So this is a picture of a ruler with laws or judgments, some kind of a legal document, laws or judgments, on an, with an important scroll, many seals on it. Now somebody important would have to take that scroll. He's going to give it to somebody to open. It has to be a very like an important official to be able to open all those seals and to either read that, those laws out or execute those judgments or carry it out. No one was found. Heaven and earth, under the earth, no one was found to open the scroll. So John says, So I wept much, because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Amen. And I looked, and I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. So the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, lamb as though it had been slain. This is obviously Jesus Christ. Clear reference to Jesus Christ. Seven horns, that just represents like power and authority. Seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. It just kind of, rep again, represents the working of God's spirit. Emphasize that he's all-seeing. He's not literally a lamb with, you know, seven eyes, like a spider, you know, on it. Seven horns, that'd just be weird. But it just, it represents something. It's symbolic. In the midst of the throne, so the lamb is Christ, that's God manifest in flesh. So he's coming right out of the throne, basically. It's not illustrating, you know, one person of the Trinity, he gets up off his throne, takes something from another one. No, he's right there out of the midst of the throne. So Christ, the one on the throne, had the seven spirits of God, again. And the lamb is God manifest in flesh. So now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Amen. So there, the worship and song provides further evidence the Lamb is Christ. Clearly, they're singing about Christ, about Jesus. Now, there is a textual variant in the song. Now, if you remember, some of you might not, some of you might, several years ago I talked about how we get the New Testament text and how there's some different textual variants in the Greek. Um, like 99.9% .9 of them are, are basically nothing, and none of them affect any key doctrines. But there is one in Revelation right here. Most manuscripts 
the song is in the third person. So they're not saying, you've redeemed us, we will reign with you. It says they. You redeemed them, they will reign. Okay, redeem men from the earth, that kind of thing. So either way you want to read it, whichever one you want to use, um, if it's us and we, the first person, then those harps and bowls and, and the song is probably just referring to the elders. Because those four living creatures aren't going to be singing, they, you've redeemed us and by your blood and we're going to reign with you as priests. It would just be the elders singing that. So it's, you know, the four living creatures and the elders fell down and worshipped and they had harps and bowls and they sang this song. If it, if it is the first person, like they're singing about what they did for them personally, that would just be referring to the elders because it wouldn't make sense of the living creatures. However, if it is, yeah, okay, it's definitely, then the elders are definitely the church. Has to be the church. Nobody else that could be. Um, if it's they and them, like the third person, then the living creatures and the elders could, they're all just kind of singing about Christ, his redemptive work, what he did for mankind. So, but either way, Either way, the elders are still most likely the church, almost definitely the church. If, it is, if they are singing it in the first person, there's no doubt that that's the church. The elders represent the church in heaven before the rapture. Um, if it's in the third person, they're still singing about what God did, redeeming us and reigning as kings and priests with God. That's the church, obviously. Um, there's, there's still enough evidence to say that the elders are the church, so... I just thought I'd throw that in there because some newer Bible translations are based off other Greek manuscript where it would say they and them. So if you read it and you're like, well, wait a minute, I'm reading the ESV and it doesn't say you redeemed us and we'll reign with you. Well, that's why there's differences there. Now, look, they had golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Now, prayers likened to incense in other passages too. Psalm 141. Psalm says, let my prayer be set before you as incense. So we see prayer is like a, an incense before God. You know, it's like a sweet aroma before God. And we'll see more of that prayers of the saints and incense again in chapter 8. But that goes up there, and they had the prayers in those bowls there. So, like, your prayers matter, you know. They go up, and God has them there, you know. It's kind of cool. He says, then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne the living creatures and the elders. So around all of that, and like in the background, voice of many angels, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands. Imagine seeing that. More, this is more evidence that the elders are not angels, because angels are here listed separately. 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands. Muriades, muriadon, taikiliades, kiliadon. It's just an uncountable number. Um, Myriade is the word for 10,000. That's where we get the word myriad from. So like myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. So it's 100 million and then thousands of thousands. Basically, there's so many you can't count them. It's just an uncountable amount of angels as far as the eye can see. That must have been amazing to see that. Saying, and they're saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. So the angels are just worshiping God. So the angels have their own song of praise. This is not a song of redemption, for they have not been redeemed. The fact that they have a different song lends further credence to the view that the elders of the church and not angels. Now why do I keep getting on that? The elders is so important who this is. Because if this really is the church, the church is up here before the tribulation period starts. That's why it's very significant that these are not angels up there. These, this is the church. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Amen. In heaven, that ju again, that just means in the sky. So it's not talking about creatures in heaven. It just means basically birds in the air in this context. Um, so we birds and animals on the earth, like, you know, cats and dogs and horses and cows and, you know, elephants and whatever, lions and tigers and bears. And under the earth, I don't know, like moles maybe or something or what things, you know, like uh, groundhogs or something. Uh, in the sea, then, you know, sharks and whales and fish, whatever it is. Um, now, they're not literally singing. It's not like he hears horses singing, you know. It just basically represents all of creation is praising God, praising, worshiping the Lamb, Christ, because he's worthy to open these seals. 
on the throne. But you notice how it didn't say all humans because we have a free will and a lot of people aren't going to worship him, sadly. But all of creation other than us is worshiping God. Amen. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. I think that's the last slide. Yes, God bless. So there we go. Setting the stage here for the next chapter, he's going to start, a spoiler alert, opening up those seals, and we're going to see what happens. So chapter 6, coming up next lesson, is the four horsemen of the apocalypse, which is a cool lesson, awesome, excited to teach it. Well, that's all I have tonight. I hope you learned something. Let's all stand. We'll just close out in prayer. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you so much for this opportunity to hear your word and to worship you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We thank you, Lord, for creating all things and for redeeming us with your blood, Lord. And we'll reign with you as kings and priests, Lord Jesus. Help us to understand the book of Revelation, to love your word, Lord Jesus. Make it known to us, reveal it to us, Lord, so we may know you better for your glory, Lord Jesus. For your glory, for the furtherance of your kingdom, that your will be done, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, thank you for being here tonight. I hope you learned something. God bless you, and we'll see you back on Sunday.